Sunday morning. Great to be with you. We have a lot planned for the next hour, including a dive into a few new bills filed this week as state lawmakers head into session in a few weeks. And that includes immediate changes to what migrants landing in South Florida may face. One of the most controversial new laws just signed this week. We check in with some of the students most affected by scrutiny on books in, on school shelves now and in Parkland. Even five years since the day of the Douglas High mass shooting, a behind the scenes look at more changes to come. But we begin with what may be a precedent setting question in a lawsuit filed in South Florida this week that for the first time argues for the rights of an unborn child in a question having nothing to do with abortion rights. In this case, it's about the unborn being in jail. The video you are about to see is a group of people in a van just before one of them fires a gun. That is the woman now in jail on murder charges and about to give birth. This video, never before made public, is being used now as evidence in the court cases. At issue now for the Third District Court of Appeals, the mother, who is a Miami-Dade County jail inmate, is asking to be released from jail because the unborn child within her is not charged with any crime. A bill filed this week in Tallahassee coincidentally addresses similar issues, and we're going to talk with that about that with the Senate sponsor in just a little while. But first, the attorney making the extraordinary argument for an unborn child to be released from jail. William Norris is here with us this morning live, and we so appreciate it. Bill, it is so good to see you. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. So this is, you know, rarely do we have an attorney who filed a lawsuit on this week in South Florida right up front, but this is such an extraordinary filing. An unborn child in custody for no crime is what your lawsuit says. Have you heard any legal argument about the rights of an unborn that does not include uh, some question of abortion rights? This, we couldn't find any, so we're calling this precedent setting. Have you? I think that it is precedent setting in its application. The, uh, the, it, it's grounded on the fact that an unborn child is a person. And the uh, U.S. Constitution and the uh, Florida Constitution grant any person uh, the right not to be deprived of liberty uh, without due process of law. And so I just want to really make clear for our, our audience that this woman's name, the inmate, the mother, her name is Natalia Harrell. We are not here this morning to argue the merits or not of her criminal case or, or anything that she may or may not have done. We're simply focusing on the rights of an unborn child because, frankly, that is one of the overarching themes of last session and possibly abortion rights uh, debate to come in this upcoming legislative session. And so I really wanted to drill down into your argument. And there, there is nothing that I read in your argument that talks about at what point in development this unborn child receives its own rights. Is there, what, what's your take on that? The, the motion makes no take on it because in this case, the, uh, the unborn child is uh, seven or eight months along. And clearly uh, uh, under, under any uh, you know, pre-abortion rights uh, jurisprudence uh, is, is, is fully, is a person. Uh, has two arms, two legs, uh, two eyes, and and uh, is, is completely viable. So at this point in this one case, that unborn child would be a, literally a month maybe from birth, and if in if it turns out to be a premature birth, uh, viable outside its mother's womb. Medically, I believe that's correct, yes. And so if, if you, when you take this case, I should say, when you take this case, I think this week there is a hearing in front of the appellate court. What you're asking them is to, what, release this unborn child from custody? Is that the essential question? Well, most, what is most important is that the, the fact that the unborn child is there, uh, is a person involved in the equation, has to be taken into consideration. Uh, and uh, to this point, there's been no consideration of the unborn child's rights at all. Uh, that it, it's very often that there's a relationship between two persons, a mother and a born child, for example, that can influence what the courts will do with the mother. Uh, 
and we're, we're simply asking that the rights of the unborn child uh, be considered and be addressed. And what do you see that, uh, what's the choice there? What, what do you see its logical conclusion being? You, you've well, actually asked for the release. We've asked for release and, and uh, we, we're looking for the opportunity of the unborn child to, uh, to, to, to be developed and born ultimately in a safe environment, not in the environment that it's in right now, which is dangerous pods within TGK. And also then the, for the unborn child to have access to proper uh, prenatal care. Uh, uh, let me let me just um, I know that's very much a part of your your piece. We did reach out in anticipation of talking about this. And, and in fairness, we did reach out to Miami-Dade uh, Corrections and Rehabilitation. And we did get a statement this morning. Uh, statement, of course, isn't news, but it definitely is a reaction to a question. So if we can put that up on the screen, I just want to read to you the Corrections and Rehab uh, Partners. It says with Jackson to provide health care to inmates in custody and ensuring inmates receive the medical care, professional, timely, and appropriate. Um, and they're doing a full review of the services in this case rendered to your client. Um, and so that, that is definitely a component and a component in the bill that we're about to talk about with State Sev Senator Chevron Jones uh, coming up later in this program. Um, here's the essential question that a as the attorney for this one woman in this one case, you know there's gonna be people watching this asking, in the broader question, releasing criminals and accused criminals on the basis of being pregnant or about to give birth raises a lot of public safety issues. There are going to be people who ask that. How do you respond to that? Well, first off, clearly the public safety issues need to be addressed. Uh, but in, in this particular case, uh, you mentioned uh, Senator Jones's bill. Uh, it provides for release uh, of a of a of a woman who's about to give birth, who's been convicted and sentenced. Uh, in this case, uh, the mother, Miss Harrell, uh, hasn't been convicted of anything. She's been accused, uh, as the videotape that you played shows. There's compelling evidence, but she has a a stand your ground immunity defense that her her attorney, her criminal attorney, is going to assert. So yes. her conviction is by no means certain. Yes, and, and absolutely, I'm glad you qualified that because what I meant was not th in this particular case, um, and everyone is presumed uh, not guilty until they, innocent until they are proven guilty, and so Ms. Harrell is the same. But in a broader policy sense, if you are successful in releasing this unborn child from jail, in general, that brings up that, those rights for pregnant women who may have already been presumed uh, or who have already been convicted, or maybe someone who is still pending a court case who might have a criminal past and a violent criminal past. So it might be someone other than Mrs. Harrell who we're talking about here. And kind of those broader implications, I think, is something that I wanted to hear you address and I think people might be concerned about. The fact that the matter should be raised and considered uh, is, is absolutely certain. Uh, as you have posed what ifs that are, are more serious and more significant, uh, you, you can go down the scale of severity as well. Uh, a woman who is denied bond for whatever reason, uh, just because of an accusation, uh, I mean, that's society deals with that. That's the that that's the question which is addressed in the courts on a routine basis. The question that is raised in this lawsuit is something that is not considered, has not been raised, and that as a person, the unborn child's constitutional rights, as it relates and, to yeah. custody in uh, in a jail or prison. It's really fascinating. Bill Norris, um, we will be following how you progress in the courts, a precedent setting case, and we appreciate uh, you allowing us to really make a lot of this public today on This Week in South Florida. Great to have you. Thank you. Up next, we are going to connect with State Senator Chevron Jones in just a little while, but first, migrants on the move, hosted and funded by the state of Florida. That law took effect this week with its signing and we look beyond the partisan debate coming up next.
Signed and in immediate effect, the multi-million dollar state plan to transport incoming migrants from anywhere to anywhere else in the United States destination, so-called sanctuary cities. Supporters call it a necessary effort to protect Florida taxpayers from the consequences of failed border security. Opponents call it an inhumane and possibly unconstitutional move. The fact is, it is state law right now, and our mission here to drill down into the practical effects from someone on the front lines, and that is Shaylin Fluherty, the executive director of Americans for Immigration Justice. Shaylin, great to have you on the program. Can you hear us okay? Just let's do a little audio check. Shaylin, you can hear us all right, right? Okay, I think we have a little problem going on right there. Can we connect with Shaylin? All right, I'll tell you what, let's take a quick break. Hello. Oh, you, you just made deadline. I was about to go to a break and fix that technicality. Shaylin, good to have you. I can only hear you. That's all you need to hear. It's just us right now and all the viewers watching. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So she was talking. Shaylin's talking to our booth. Let me a little inside. TV now now I can hear to the booth. Uh, we're, okay. Now you can hear us. And I just want to thank our entire audience for going off the rails and getting back on with us in real time television. So, all right. And so, now I can't hear you, Glenna. <laughs> here we go. All right. Well, I'm not quite sure to, what to do from here. So why don't I you can, do this? I, I can hear you again. Good morning. Hi. Good morning to you. All right. I'm going to go for it now. Okay. So, let's do this. Let's go. All right, Shaylin, um, just to bring you up to speed, we really want to get into the practical effects of this new law on, on migrant transport. Um, you are on the front lines of helping migrants. And, and I just kind of want to set the, the tone here for viewers. We have a very engaged audience who knows that this is kind of a 2.0, putting into some legislative fixes to what the governor's directive was that we didn't know about until everybody saw Venezuelan migrants in Martha's Vineyard last year. So that said, um, it, is this legislative fix in some ways actually a much better way? Well, it, it's an interesting question because I think what um, Section 185, which no longer exists as, and has been replaced with this new bill, indicates is that our state government does not understand at all how federal immigration enforcement works. I think that kind of reiterates really some of these legal challenges that are facing the governor's office here in Florida, challenges that articulate that the federal government has the sole authority to enforce our immigration laws and not the states, right? This is the very thing that makes us one unified nation and oh, not 50 individual countries here yes. in the United and, States. And, and so let, no. let, me just, let me just jump in because I like, I like this kind of conversation aspect to it because what, what I think an opponent would say, what I've heard our friends in the legislature say is that we're not getting involved in immigration issues. We're getting involved in protecting Florida from the effects of people coming illegally by taking them to places where there are people who say they will care for them. I think that would be, um, you know, I, I have no horse in the race, but I think that's what I've heard them say. I think words matter. And some of your coverage has really identified the fact that the words in this new legislation have no legal meaning under our federal immigration code. And so what that means is that it makes no sense in practice or in law what is now legislated by our state. So more specifically, you know, that word illegal immigrants um, is one that conflicts, I think, at least in, in layman's terms with the paradigm that is now in our state legislative law, which is this term of unauthorized immigrants. This non in this this kind of terminology that somebody would be inspected and unauthorized therefore at risk of being transported throughout the united states by florida taxpayers dollars um, really kind of raises this question of who is an unauthorized person and what's interesting is that somebody who um maybe our, our florida state government might deem unauthorized actually could be authorized by the federal government to be here. This could include somebody, for example, who has temporary protected status and a work permit, somebody who's been living in Florida for years, for example. And so this, this law in practice 
really conflicts with federal immigration law and, and intends to set up this independent but competing federal immigration scheme that leaves us all kind of afraid and wondering what it will look like in practice. So we had a couple of legislative leaders uh, talk about this with us. One just last week who was saying this is going to be completely voluntary. Nobody's going to be moved unless they okay their own transport. Does that, does that soften the blow at all? It doesn't. And, and let me tell you why, because I think it's such a great question. You know, somebody might decide, let's say, if we find them in San Antonio and they are a recently arriving immigrant who has been um, kind of deemed appropriate for release by the federal government. At the time of release, the federal government puts really meaningful conditions on that person. Um, those conditions almost always include the obligation, a legal obligation to reside in an address that has been approved by the federal government. So for for example, you might come into contact with someone in San Antonio who has been released by federal immigration officials for the purpose of proceeding in front of an immigration court in Miami, Florida. Um, and in conjunction with that process, that person must reside at an address that has been deemed approved by the federal government. And they sign documents that say, I will not leave that address without the federal government's written permission. They would also have the duty, like I said, to appear in immigration court. And if they don't appear in immigration court, they would be ordered deported. And so if a um, contractor of the Florida government arrives in San Antonio and says, hey, would you like to go to Martha's Vineyard instead? They're offering jobs and free housing. And that person says, well, gosh, I really wanted to go live with my family, but you know, I actually think that sounds like a, a great idea. I'll take your free flight to Martha's Vineyard. What that does is kind of involuntarily has somebody um, directly not comply with what they're required to comply with under federal law. And if you are hearing these advisals by somebody on behalf of the state of Florida, it's not unreasonable for someone to think that they actually have permission of some government authority to go to Martha's Vineyard, when in fact, they don't have that permission from the federal government at all. And that, that was actually one of the things that we discussed. I, I have a feeling that we are going to be sort of figuring this out real time to see what, if, if anything, happens. Um, Shailen Fluharty, I'm so grateful for your time, and I'm sorry the technology devils got in our way, but we will definitely have you back to, to sort of take us through this whole issue as it happens. Thanks so Glad much. Glad to be here. All right, take care. Uh, okay, next, we are going back to our top story, the bill that takes on the question of how unborn babies are treated when their mothers are accused or convicted criminals. This would be called Ava's Law, and the South Florida senator who filed it is here next. Coincidence that this same week as that lawsuit filed involving a pregnant jail inmate, a new bill filed in Tallahassee addresses some of those same issues, separate and unrelated, but also raising questions of how Florida should handle the intersection of crime, punishment, childbirth, and the rights of an unborn child. South Florida State Senator Chevron Jones has sponsored what would be called Ava's Law, and he has actually in past years as well, prenatal attention and treatment is the focus, as is the intersection of crime and parenthood. Good morning, Senator Jones. Good morning, Glenda. Thank you for having me. Um, so thanks for being spontaneous with us this week because you, you have been and always will be. But th this is such an interesting conversation in light of this other lawsuit that was filed in the appeals court. But Ava's Law is really about being pregnant in jail and getting health care and getting treatment. Is that is that valid? That's very valid. And actually, this is the second year that we are attempting to try this because the bill is really about providing mothers with the treatment and care that's necessary uh, to deliver their child safely before they uh, even continue their sentence. And, and just like you made mention of the bill being Ava's Law, uh, and for those who don't know, this is um, in honor of the unborn child of Erica Thompson, who died after Ms. Thompson was refused treatment and care by jail officials despite Ms. Thompson and Christ for help while she was being, while she was incarcerated. And that, just to be clear, that wasn't in a South Florida jail. That was upstate. So that, was, that was upstate, yeah. correct. Okay. So, so I don't, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you're going to be getting bipartisan support when it comes to the health and safety of a woman and her unborn child. But a component of this bill allows a judge to stay the sentence of a convicted criminal uh, who will who will otherwise leave incarceration 
if she's pregnant, about to give birth, or maybe having, you know, recently give birth. So mm -hmm. th that component, you know, there, that might be great and healthy and fine for a woman and her child. And there might be cases where a woman is a dangerous criminal. So take mm -hmm. us through, how, for those who are thinking about how this affects public safety, take us through that component. Well, I mean, I think the biggest thing is that given the judge the discretion um, to be able to decide whether or not the mother should be should remain incarcerated or whether the, the whether or not the, the the mother is at risk of of society going out, it's still at the discretion uh, of the judge. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, this this will give women the right to a pregnancy test within seventy two hours, as well as a deferral of up to twelve weeks after delivery of delivery of their baby once they are sentenced. And so, all we're trying to do is ensure that once the mother has the child, that the that they receive the necessary medical care um, that has been recommended by um, by physicians uh, that she needs because at the end of the day it's really about making sure that the baby is protected and there is time that where the mother needs to be with that child um, but if they are a danger then the, again the judge still have that discretion to be able to make and that actually was part of the reason why we ran into uh, some trouble last year with this bill because we're trying to figure out what does that look like and I'm sure as we go through the process there will be some amendments and things as we work because it is a bipartisan bill um, to, because we want to make sure that public safety still remains uh, the most highest point when we're passing legislation. And so at this point within the bill, it looks like the judge, a judge, will take into consideration uh, a, the past background, any criminal background okay. prior to and, and that kind of thing. So, That's correct. Yeah. So is there then, on, on the flip side, is there any concern that having a, a law like this might in some way jeopardize the parental rights of a woman who is, um, I, I'm going to go with convicted of a crime. Is there any, any concern that the parental rights of a, an inmate, someone incarcerated or whose sentence has, is being postponed? Because now the state is involved. Now there are guardianship issues. Now there, there is focus. I mean, what's the concern there? Well, we haven't heard that concern, and I'm uh, just just right now. Uh, you just right made mention of it. But we Glad have to give that you something concern. to think about as you take this forward. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate. And we, and we will. Again, it's at the beginning stages of the process, and yeah. so we're going to work to build to to work it through the um, the process over the next few weeks. So, and I want to, in the short time we have this morning, I, I want to get your take because right now the rights of an unborn child in Florida is solely focused in the debate over abortion rights. We were last year when the bill that is now law, abortion restrictions, were being debated. The really one of the big topics was the viability. At what point is an unborn child viable outside the mother's womb? Is is there any consideration of yours as you go into a very divided legislature this year that something from this bill will either way affect what what might be coming because it's been telegraphed, what might be coming in further abortion rights restrictions or not? Is this do you think that the questions you're posing kind of have a larger context when it comes to Florida law. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's just, it's, a, it's such a slippery slope, especially if uh, dealing with what we're dealing with in Florida. When we, do, uh, when we do come speak about abortion and the direction that the state of Florida is moving we, uh, with a woman's right to choose. And I don't want us to muddy um, this issue with Ava's law with what the what the legislature is trying to push, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, then we must make sure that all mothers and their children are cared for uh, in this state. And we cannot allow another preventable tragedy like this to happen again or or it happened here uh, in Florida but outside and apart from what we know this legislative session yeah. is going to be 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 about I'm, I'm hoping that they don't convolute the two because this is about one public safety two about the safety of the child and the mother who are incarcerated no matter what they've done uh the the, the child deserves um to be safe and the mother deserves to be safe too I can't imagine a more bipartisan thought than that state senator <laughs> Chevron Jones Great to have you aboard, as always. Have a beautiful Sunday. You too. Thanks. All right, next, this week, community marked five years passing since the profound consequences of the mass shooting at Stoneman Douglas High. One is now a revisit of the death penalty law. The details and a reporter debrief is next. <laughs>
five years as of this week, no day has gone by without the Stoneman Douglas High community in our minds, whether or not in the headlines, and there have been plenty of those. The most recent potential changes to Florida's death penalty laws directly tied to the jury recommendation of the Parkland shooter. This week, Local 10's Christina Vasquez put all of that into context. The court imposes a mandatory life sentence in November without the possibility of parole. The life sentences the Parkland trial judge imposed on the Parkland shooter for the murders of 17 Marjorie Stoneman Douglas staff and students on Valentine's Day 2018 were recommended by a divided jury, three who chose life. The energy was so heated um, that we wanted to get out of that room. There were many of us in that room that truly did try to seek justice. And nine who recommended death. Seeing the faces of these families, seeing their reaction, it does still feel in part like we failed them. And I don't think justice was served in that case. And now this, a proposed change to jury verdicts in death penalty cases. If passed, state law would toggle back to non-unanimous jury recommendations. If at least eight jurors determine that the defendant should be sentenced to death, the bills read, the jury's recommendation to the court shall be a sentence of death. It's important that not just one person has that sole power and is fully aware that this is the power that they have in their hands. Um, I think it's, it's fair. Parkland was the deadliest U.S. mass shooting to go before a jury. Man, did we feel every inch of that, you know, walking through the school grounds. There is an active shooter working at Douglas. Multiple gunshots are being fired. The 1200 building of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. I heard uh, the shots were coming from the freshman building. <laughs> Stands as a haunting reminder. Of the horrors that unfolded on Valentine's Day 2018. As the gunshots were getting closer and louder. The barrel of that AR-15 just ambushed our classroom. Jurors during the Parkland shooter's penalty phase toward the building, preserved as a crime scene, bearing witness to bloodstained hallways and classrooms punctuated by day of love mementos, a chilling view of terror suspended in time. I noticed that she had passed away. One of the students was injured. Two of which were shot dead um, right next to me. Broward Schools tells me it remains the district's intent to demolish the 1200 building as soon as possible once it is released by the state attorney's office. You see, the building is still part of a case. This time, the upcoming trial of Scott Peterson, the former BSO deputy facing several charges to include multiple counts of child neglect related to the 2018 school shooting. As for what happens once the building is eventually demolished, Broward Schools tells me future plans for the site have yet to be determined. Christina Vasquez right here for what we call our reporter debrief segment. Um, so much to talk about because what a lot of people might not know is you are one of very few people who have been in that building, uh, did the walkthrough when the jury was there. Um, and so I want people to kind of hear your impressions as a an objective observer but yet a member of this community who can't not be impacted by what you saw. Thank you for the question and for being here and the opportunity, I really appreciate that. There are certain cases, there are certain stories and experiences that as you know, just sit with you. And this will be one of them for me. In fact, the word I would use is that it's something that will, I know, haunt me, right, for the rest of my life. I will always, remember what it was to be in that building. One of the reasons why I put that piece together, answering the question of what's gonna happen with the 1200 building is because it's one of the top viewer questions I received post trial. Sure. And when you go to that building and you're on the school grounds, is the first time I really understood how close the building is to current classrooms that students and staff are utilizing. And it really is this imposing structure that just speaks to what was the darkest day for that community. So when, when you were there, as impactful as it was, is it a significant trip for not only the jurors in the sentencing phase, but Scott Peterson's trial jurors will likely see it too. It, is that an impactful moment for jury? 
Well, what's interesting is a, a distinction between the two cases that we learned. So the jurors in the Parkland trial did go inside the building. We yes. learned from the defense attorney for Scott Peterson, his request is for the jurors not to go into the building, but just see the exterior footprint for reasons that he'll articulate to the jury for his Where case. Where Scott but, Peterson was. Right, to get a yeah. sense of the distance and yeah. what he says is a pronounced echo in the area. But I have to say for as difficult as it was to be in those spaces, it is gruesome it is bloody, it is absolutely chilling to see what truly is, when you talk about fear, when you talk about terror, when you talk about a journey to, for survival, those concepts yeah. are grounded and anchored and in very difficult physical evidence in those spaces. But I found it at the time to be incredibly helpful in its own way because it provided so much context. Because remember, when the jurors walked the path the shooter did through the building, that was after they heard all of that harrowing testimony from survivors, from medical examiners. Yeah. You know, I got to see the same sensitive evidence that was not shared to the public, but we, we shared with you all in terms of verbal descriptions that they saw of autopsy photos and crime scene photos. It's a big building, it's a big crime scene. We're talking three floors, several classrooms. And so when you go through that building, at least for me, it provided a lot of context and spatial context. And all of a sudden, all of those pieces of evidence over that course of time just sort of cinched right into place. But it was also, again, harrowing because you'd go, I'd, I'd walk into a classroom and I could hear the testimony because now I could see what the teachers and survivors were saying. And as soon as I'd walk in, for instance, when you go into teacher Deborah Haas's classroom, she had told jurors that the intensity of those high velocity bullets emanating from the AR-15 style rifle the Parkland shooter used was rattling the ceiling tiles, if you remember. And she talked about that there was a dust and haze in the classroom. And you see that film of, of white dust over laptops that are still open uh, along her desk that's disheveled in the corner where you see that you know, evidence of a mad frozen. attempt of all of these students and staff to try to gain shelter. Um, frozen in time. Frozen in time. So let me take you then, with, with all of that said, now the Florida legislature is looking at vamp, revamping, rolling back really the death penalty law so that it does not have to be unanimous anymore. Um, clearly, the jury had a couple of people who felt that death was not appropriate. Some of the Parkland families, certainly that is not a unanimous group in politics and policy. Some of them thought that the death penalty was not appropriate. And yes, you saw this backlash sort of from so many people when the shooter was not sentenced to death. What do you foresee going with what you know and what you see? What do you think is gonna happen um, as, as this is debated? The intersection of this case and now this proposed change to death penalty jury recommendations is fascinating because there is such a plurality of perspectives. Yes. As you just hit upon, you have some of the family members that felt here in Florida, we have the death penalty. They view this as uh, what the legal system views it as. It's the most punitive form of sentencing. And so in that outrage is a word you hear a lot in that anger, that is underpinned by just bottomless grief and pain. And you have their perspective, which is how could even three jurors on this jury panel not think that the most punitive sentence in our legal system was appropriate for what happened to my loved one. You have nine jurors on that panel that did think death was the appropriate punishment. And in speaking with that one Parkland juror who thought death was the appropriate punishment, it was interesting to note, you know, she said her and her colleagues, they have the trauma of just not walking through the building, which we just discussed, hearing all that witness testimony. She described it as going through 17 eulogies. All of that evidence, they feel a trauma of failing, that they failed the families. And then you have the legal perspective on all of this. I mean, the one thing we as Americans value out of almost anything else is liberty. So when you're talking about something like a death sentence, it's the ultimate act of taking away someone's liberty, right? You're, you, you've decided as a, as a society in that case to take someone's life. So legal experts will say that is why due process and constitutional safeguards, these things are very important. And I think, I think what happens is when you hear that, through a lens of, let's say, another case. Take a high-profile case where you've heard someone's been exonerated from death row because advancements in DNA technology prove they were never at the scene. Then when you hear this you know, due process, constitutional rights, safeguards, you want to make sure there's a jury of your peers are unanimous in deciding 
that that death is the appropriate punishment. It's almost like folks can see that through the lens of a case like that. The Parkland shooter case is so egregious and so horrific. And it's also in its own way an outlier because remember, guilt was never at question. Yeah. Right? And so which played a large part in that. So legal analysts say that's why they caution to take a case as as unique as Parkland and use that to underpin a policy change, there's a little warning flag some folks put up. Yeah. And my, my question was, and I know you and I talk about this a lot, we kind of share, I think, a very similar process to our reporting, which is always a thought of context. Okay, well, where does this stand on a nationwide view? And I thought that was really interesting. The uh, American Bar Association telling me of 27 states that allow the death penalty, um, only one is non-unanimous, and that's Alabama 10 to 2. There's two other states that do let a judge decide if it's a divided jury, but Florida would be an outlier. Well, we will see. It's going to be uh, an interesting session, and your perspective is so unique and so amazing, and I'm so glad that you were here to share that with everyone. And I just want to make mention that I think I, I personally, and I know you might have too, have promised the families that we will not give notoriety to the shooter by saying his name or showing his face, and I appreciate that you honored that here today. Thank you, Eric. All right, up next, Next Gen, our newest segment with the youngest and in some cases most important views on News of the Week. Stay tuned. regular with us here, you know how focused we are at making sure South Florida's diverse perspectives have voice here, and that includes the youngest among us who want to see their takes reflected in the news and issues of the week. So today we turn to Asha Cope Edwards and Ashley Acero Rodriguez for that conversation. Both high school seniors, right? Yes. Engaged in planning a protest tomorrow. Asha, let's start with you. What, what are you protesting tomorrow and why? Well, tomorrow we're going to be protesting the book ban started by Ron DeSantis. Okay, um, let me just stop you right there because we, we roll factually here. There is no book ban. Did you know that? Yes. Okay, so it. we'll start there. So you're going to protest a book removal process? Yes. Okay. Um, we think it's really important that everyone um, who lives here is able to be represented in the media um, because what yeah. we consume is who we become. And so we want to see um, everyone reflected in um, what we're reading in schools. And a lot of kids don't read outside of school. So if they don't mm -hmm. have opportunities to get books from school, they're not going to get them from anywhere else. Understood. So we, we've actually heard that, that really significant argument you know, among people of all ages. So you're planning this protest tomorrow. Tomorrow to sort of get that out there. Yeah. How, how did you come to feel so strongly enough to plan a public protest? So being that we have grown up in South Florida, we've seen all the minority groups here, you know, we feel really connected to this environment and being that we grew up in the public education system, it's very important for us to pe for people to be able to access education the correct way, you know? We don't want just one narrative in the media allowing people to change their ideologies or not have freedom of thinking, you know, it's very important for do us. Do you, um, you ever watch our program? Yes, I do. <laughs> do you watch our program? <laughs> yes. So, um, you know, a lot of people watch different, get their news from different places. Mm -hmm. Do you, Asha, do you think there is one narrative in the media? Um, I don't think there is one full narrative, mm -hmm. but I think there is uh, actively um, kind of uh, something going on where people are actively trying to push one thing. Who, who um, and what? There's, I think there's an overwhelmingly um, westernized narrative that being trying to be being pushed right now super um american centric uh, by I, it's my job to drill down into okay being pushed by whom? uh current media we see a lot of like our politicians now yeah. kind of an effort to kind of uh stop the voices of people yeah. who don't look like them or have different backgrounds do you feel like that too yes he's definitely he, well, he, him he, him as Ron DeSantis and other political figures that um can be very radical at some, to certain degrees. Um, they're trying to censor voices that are usually marginalized. And okay, yeah, we, yeah. I'm sorry, no, I no. don't interrupt yeah. you. And just like ahead. being that America was built upon the work of minority groups, and you know, the whole point of America is to be a democratic country, we shouldn't be able to censor certain groups and certain voices. Okay, so being the very fair program that we are, and we do not look mm -hmm. through any partisan lens, right. um, I'm going to have to, because we have no one who thinks other than you do here, I'm going to take that position and sort of throw out to you, can you imagine that there are people that your age who, who feel like they're not, this isn't censorship whatsoever. And what I think you've heard a lot of people on this program who are in to the makings of this law, 
saying that this is something that a parent has the right to go do now. Look at these books, challenge the books. The books go through a process. Mm -hmm. There are some books challenged that are still on the shelves. Um, do you do you know of books that were taken off? You're both from Broward, right? Yes. Broward, 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 Broward County Schools gave me a list of which books were removed. Have you seen what those are? I've seen some of them, but recently. How many? There, Pop was, quiz. there was a multiple, but the majority of the books that have been banned were in Duval County. So Broward yes. County hasn't seen the effects yet, but I'm scared that we're going to see it soon. And so we want to take action now. Okay, so the, the three, there are three yeah. books in Broward. Um, and I think three, three books in Broward according to the district, yes, just a, and, and two according to the state. And in Miami-Dade, three books, titles removed. And all of them, I, I actually read through them. I'm a parent, and I see, I mean, uh, I see why a parent might object to this in school. I see why another parent might not object to it, but there is that process. Mm -hmm. So as, as a student who has parents, what do you think about your parents' rights to monitor what you read in school? Well, I definitely think that and you're parents, a senior, so you know. Yeah, I definitely think it's important to, as a parent, to monitor what your child is reading. But at the end of the day, um, a child should be able. As kids, we're supposed to learn and read. And just because our parent doesn't agree with something that we're learning, um, it's stuff that we're going to learn anyway. When we go to school, our parents can't control what we're going to learn there or we're going to see there. So it's important that we're exposed, and we have the option to be exposed. These books aren't being pushed down our throats. If a kid wants to read the book, they can. And if they don't want to read the book, that's also their prerogative. So that's an interesting perspective I want to take to you, Ashley. If you, you know, your parents may not agree with your perspectives on things, um, but do you think that because you are still their student, are you 18 yet? Yes. Okay, so you're an adult, but you're still kind of their kid, yes. because that's how it rolls. So do you think they have um, an option now they have more of an option that they did with new laws, parental rights laws. Do you um, do you support the fact that a parent, maybe not of an 18-year-old, but of a five-year-old or a nine-year-old, has more of the right to go to school, see what their child's doing, what their child's learning, and object to it if they want? Um, I say yes, but when it comes to the public education system, there are certain things that you may not align with in, in your core values that you have to just accept because at the end of the day you're going to a public education system you know you have your student your child in that school for a reason if you don't have if you have certain political views or certain religious views that don't align with the education system that you're currently in then you should look at private schools that focus and align more with your values the education system is supposed to be open to everybody you know what do you think about that i fully agree with that i mean right now we actually i think there's been one book banned at nova that was addressing um Basically, our bodies and like um, sexual acts and things like and our anatomy and things like that have been banned. And it's like you don't have to agree that your child should be reading it, but it should be open to any child who wants to learn about yeah. their body. What one quick question before we run out of time? Do you know anybody in your group that feels totally opposite than you do? Um, not really. Yeah. No. How about you? <laughs> no. no, no. Okay, I want to just put a call out there to any young people who want to come in here and debate this from the other side. Hit me up and we're going to stay tuned. We'll give you some addresses that you can use to do that. So right now, Ashley Acero Rodriguez, so good to have you. Asha Cope Edwards, you rock. I love that you are here and I love that you are sharing with our viewers your take on things. See you Thank soon. you. Okay. Thank you. All right, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. Seven, you know you're a big part of this program and right there you can connect so easily on social media easy to follow and find reach out at Glenna WPLG Facebook Twitter Instagram we are so easy to find thank you so much for spending this hour with us and remember keep in touch